Welcome to the next installment of the APSC Cloud Forum of Cardiovascular Disease series. Today's topic is, on, is uh, themed as a paradigm shift for pharmacological as well as non-pharmacological treatment of acute and chronic heart failure, the Asia-Pacific uh, point of view. A date same today is the 17th uh, November 2021, 12 p.m. Singapore, Taiwan time. I just like to give a quick preamble to this today's uh, session. There are more and more really trials coming out, uh, pushing forward guidelines regarding acute and chronic heart failure management, where Paradigm, Paragon, DAPA HF, Emperor Reduce, as well as Preserve. And this have demonstrated clear cut benefit for both the ARNI uh, class of drugs as well as SGLT2 inhibitors in the acute and chronic uh, pharmacological management of heart failure. We've, frankly speaking, reduced to mildly reduced to even a subset of normal EF uh, heart failure patients uh, in the HEPAF group. The CASO, uh, PEF, AF, CRT, COAP, and MITRO FR demonstrate uh, both the decision making points for radio frequency catheter ablation for AF, with or without uh, CRT therapy in AF complicating uh, HEFRAP patient, as well as a mitral clip HOH repair therapy for severe functional mitral regurgitation, complicating the subgroup of patients with half ref So pharmacological combined with non-pharmacological device approaches are evolving as a core components, acute as well as chronic progressive heart failure management. And today we have great speakers to tease out this trials as well as give us further insights. So my name is Jack, uh, the immediate past president for the APSC, your chair for session one. And I'm very happy to have my chairperson too, Professor Chimin Lee, Professor of Medicine at NTUH Taipei, Taiwan, as the chair and closing uh, uh, chair for this session. Our first speaker is a good friend, Dr. Park Jinju from South Korea. He's going to speak to us on the piece on ARNI, replacing ACE inhibitor ROS therapy as the first line therapy for acute as well as chronic heart failure in HEFREF from the ACC ESC guideline to the real world. This will be followed by the renowned Dr. Rong Roach from Thailand. As you can see, he's the president at the current ASEAN Federation of Cardiology, president at the Thai Heart Association of Thailand, president at the Heart Failure Council of Thailand, as well as the Thai Society of Cardiovascular mm -hmm. Imaging. He's gonna to speak to us on SGLT2 inhibitors on the front line for HEFREF, HEPAP management with or without diabetes, drawing on DAPA HF, Emperor Reduce Preserve to the real world. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Chi Chie Yo, Assistant Professor from NTU H, Taiwan Taipei. He's, she's going to then switch tracks into AF junctional ablation plus CRT versus catheter ablation rhythm control in half ref complicating persistent AF. So we're going to switch track into AF complicating heart failure, drawing from the castle. Uh, uh, APAF CRT trials to the real world. The finishing lecture will be given by my good friend, Professor Yu Si Hui, Senior Consultant Cardiologist at the National Heart Center Singapore. She's going to speak then as a closing uh, lecture on functional mitral regurgitation and its outcome in HEFREF and its implication for device therapy in HH repair in mitral clip. So without further ado, I would like to give a quick uh, disclaimer. The content is copyrighted by the APSC. The views expressed here are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. This content is currently made live stream through the APSC Cloud, APSC Facebook, as well as YouTube pages. And uh, we'll draw on the first lecture now from Professor Park Jinju on the ANI class of drugs. Jinju, please. Thank you very much for the great introduction. Um, I'm gonna talk about RNA in heart failure. I'm Jinjo Park, I'm from Seoul National University. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about chronic heart failure and the famous program HF study. As you know, heart failure had very bad prognosis, the red lines heart failure. It is worse prognosis than most cancers except for lung cancer. And I'm pretty sure if you have a heart failure patient for the acute heart failure admission, the remaining survival is about 2.5 years. 
after three admission, the remaining survives less than one year. And that's the reason why you have patient with acute heart failure admission less than three or four times because all of them die. But fortunately, there are currently eight classes of drug in HFREF, which improve the survival, starting with ACE inhibitors, beta block, et cetera. And the fifth drug is sacriptivarsatan. So when you look at the clinical study results here, beginning with the SOLVE trial in 1991 with enalapril, then beta blockers, bisopro, MRA, and uh, ivabradin and sacriptivarsatan, et cetera, these drugs are targeting neurohumoral activation. The three other drugs, SGL2 inhibitor is a cardiometabolic drug, uh, <clears throat> very secret, and uh, omega to work on the cellular level. So we always talked about neurohumoral uh, activation or the inhibition in heart failure, but now we are moving from that term to the neurohumoral modulation. So you have a sympathetic nervous system, a ROS system, metric peptide system, and kinin system. If you wanna block the sympathetic nervous system, you use beta blockers. For ROS inhibition, you have a ROS inhibitor, so it's AC inhibitor, ARB, and MRA. As for the nitric peptide, we have an, an, an enhancer. We enhance nitric peptide level by inhibiting the neprilism. So I personally say that nitric peptide is the natural antagonist of the RAS system because it does exactly the opposite of the RAS system. So if you have an angiotensin II here, it exerts via angiotensin receptor, sodium water retention in kidney, but the nitric peptide, as the name says, causes natriuresis. It also dilates the vessel, inhibits hypertrophy and fibrosis, and lowers the sympathetic outflow. So it does all the good things out uh, and in the, in the dual humor pathway. <clears throat> when you have RNA, sacrificial the sacrum between LB metabolized to LBQ657, which inhibits neprilysin. And this neprilysin is necessary for degradation of AMPP and CMP. And by inhibiting this neprilysin, you have enhanced function of the nitric peptides here with all the good um, outcomes. And you have a bisatin resistant RAS blocker, and it's a very typical and classic ARB, and that blocks the RAS pathway. So we have a dual action with the secretive bisatin. In the Paradigm HF study, which include ejection for less than 40% heart failure with reduced EF patient, more than 8,000 patients were enrolled. They were randomized either to RNA as the 696 or enalapril, and the primary compost, a primary endpoint was the compost of CV death or heart vascularization. The study has a running period, and after this running period, the patients were randomized to the two groups. And the primary endpoint, the CV death or heart vascularization could be reduced by 20%. If you look at the curve, there's a very early separation of the curves. And the p-value has 0.0000N2, so 770, and number needed to treat was 21. This highly significant p-value suggests that this, has, this study has a power of two or three randomized clinical trials. When you're looking at the cardiovascular death, there's a 20% risk, risk, uh, risk reduction with a very high significant p-value, 21% uh, risk reduction for heart failure hospitalization, <clears throat> and 16% risk reduction for all mortality. So number of need to treat in Paradigm H was, HF study was 21%. And it was a study that compared with enalapril, an active comparator. In SOLVE study, enalapril compared to placebo had an NNT of 23, relative risk reduction by 16%. So when you compare the studies here below, they are comparing against the placebo, 
what is the primary HF, you have an active comparator. When you perform a putative placebo comparison, sacrificial varsatum may reduce the risk by around 50%, much stronger. What about these um, eight secondary outcomes? The KCCQ uh, score is better within the sacrificial varsatum group compared to the Inala pre group. The so safety issue was very important because it was the first in uh, first class drug that was tested in human, and a patient with the sacrificial varsatin had, had a more symptomatic hypertension, but they had lower increase in creatinine level, and most importantly, the cough they had less cough, and the injury edema did not differ between both groups. Sacrative varsatum can prolong survival about two years. If you start the drug at the age of 55, you have a survival gain of 2.1 year. When you start the drug at age of 65, you have a survival gain of 1.6 years. So in 2012, there's, it does not mention anything about sacrative varsatum. The paradigm HF study came out in 2014 and after two years, the ESC guideline includes RNA, secretary varsatin in the guideline. The very recent guideline from ESC suggests to use asymptom ARB, beta blocker, MRA, and SA2 inhibitor, which is so called the Fantastic Four. And when you're looking at the guideline, the first, this four Fantastic Four are recommended, but ARB is recommended if the patient the AC inhibitor or RNA intolerant, the reason is that ARB has failed to show survival benefit, whereas these four drug classes have improved survival in half red patient. I'll show you a case of a patient. It's a 40-year-old male patient who came with dysmia. He has a 10-year history of a hypertension, congestive heart failure with NYHA function class 2 dysmia. One month ago, he has this aggravated to NIH function class three or four. He was on Cavadil and Valsatan, and his blood pressure was 136 over 80. <clears throat> At the first medical contact, his chest X-ray shows a large heart cardiomegaly here. ECG shows a very large QRS complex with a T-wave uh, Invasion in the lateral leads. So he, he received Cavadil 20.5 milligram twice a day, Iva brought in 5 milligram, Sacrativar Satin 100 milligram twice a day, and Furosement 40 milligram twice a day. And after six months of optometric therapy, his chest, his heart side decreased in the chest x ray. And the, the large QRS complex in the initial ECG a decrease in size here. Addition at the first medical contact, the LV anti-size diameter was 64 millimeter, ejection fraction of 23, and after six months, the heart decreased by 10 millimeter, ejection fraction increased from 23 to 51%. The next question is that whether we can use the Sacrative varsatin in acute heart failure. You may say, why not? Because it's safe in chronic heart failure, but there are some things you have to consider. So paradigm HF study involved patients who are stable heart, chronic heart failure patient. And PION study is the first study which addressed the question in acute heart failure. The Pradam HF study, as I told before, included chronic heart failure patient. The patient need to be on stable guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure for at least four weeks. And patient with acute decompensate heart failure were excluded. When you're looking at the study design of the Pradam HF, it has two periods. The one is the running period the second was a treatment period. At the screening, there were more than 10,500 patients who were screened and entered the running uh, phase. And they were exposed to enalapril. 
if everything was okay, then the patient randomized. And in this time, more than 20, uh, more than 2,100 or 20% of the patient were excluded from the Paradigm A chip study. So the safety issue is not clear whether you can use it from the very beginning. So Pioneer A chip study included the hospitalization patient with the acute compass, the heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. If they are stable, they were randomized either to Sacrative by Satan or Enala Pregri for eight weeks. <clears throat> the inclusion criteria were acute heart failure, ejection fraction less or equal to 40%, increase is anti proven P level, and they should be stabilized. That means they do not receive any, uh, any inotropes, no IV bus dilators, no increase in IV diuretics, and blood pressure greater than 100. So over 440 patients were randomized to Sacrative by Satan, and 441 patients were randomized to Nala Pre Group. The mean, median ejection fraction of 24, 25. Systolic blood pressure was 118, 118 here. The primary endpoint was the <clears throat> time average, the proportional change of anti proven P level from the baseline. And if you look at the NALAPRO, it has a very good decrease of the anti proven P level, but in the Sacrative Varsatan level, the anti proven P decreased about 45% at one week. And at the end of study, after two weeks, greater than 450%. So there is a 30 percent risk reduction with the Sacrative Varsatan compared to Enalapril. Uh, safety is the big issue here because we wanted to know whether the Sacrative Varsatan is safe in acute heart failure patient. What's in renal function, 13.6 versus 14.7, no difference. The same is for hyperkalemia, symptomatic hypertension, and injury edema events. There were additional clinical endpoints. The serious composite of endpoints were 9.3 in Sacrative Versatan and Anala pre 16.8%, so that the heart rate is 0.54, which was mainly driven by the reduction in death and rehospitalization rate. When you look at the heart rate ratio, they are pretty the same. So <clears throat> when you plot the outcome here, Using a couple of my survivor curves, Sacrative Varsatan patient had less event, a reduction of the risk by 46%, number needed to treat to 13%, uh, 13. And most important is very early separation of the curves. This is another open label extension trial that patient who are in the Enala program, they were switched to Sacrative Varsatan and were followed. Interestingly, the curve between the, um, between the two groups were parallel to each other. That means that when you have a loss in this uh, treatment period, cannot be caught up or cannot be made up during the, uh, during the follow-up, that means you should use the drug as soon as possible to have the early benefit. The conclusion of the pioneer age of study was that the primary, as the primary endpoint, the great reduction in of anti probium pill level, and it is safe because the rate of worsening renal function, hyperkalemia, symptomatic hypertension, and angioedema did not differ between the two groups. So when you're looking at the drugs in acute heart failure, actually all failed until now. Nesiritide or ulitide, the recombinant BMP analog failed. Uh, Serolex also failed in the Relax HF study. The two drugs which were promising is the SJ2 inhibitor with the and the Solis AHF trial and Sacrative Varsatan in the Pioneer HF trial. I'm going to talk a little bit about this drug in a um, special perspective, let's say. The first issue is reverse remodeling. So if you have a heart failure patient, there is an initial injury to the myocyte or the cardiac myocyte and the matrix, and they will lead to systemic neurohumor overactivation 
that leads to these structural changes and adaptive remodeling and programmatic voicing of the LV function. The kind of remodeling is associated with the morbidity and mortality. So if you have a large heart, the patient has worse prognosis. The hemodynamic alteration, which is the most congestion due to water and solid and water retention, will lead to symptoms. The best drug which will, uh, which will improve the hemodynamic uh, congestion is the diuretics. It leads to immediate improvement of the symptom, but as you know, LASIX does not improve the survival. Beta blocker, RAS inhibitor, they do cause a reverse remodeling. They improve the survival, but as you know, if you give this drug, the symptoms of a heart failure patient will not be better immediately. So we have two pathways. And if you want to improve the outcome of the patient, you need to target the uh, remodeling of the heart. Uh, in the proof HF study, um, there was, um, this study investigated the association between anti problem P change and cardiac remodeling and include a half red patient, about 800, mean ejection fraction was 29%, 65 years old, and it was single arm study, so that all patients received succotive farsatan 200 milligrams twice a day. And if you look at the patient, uh, as I told, the 60, they were 65 years old. Only very few Asians were included in the study. They were well treated, beta blocker 95%, ACIN there, ARB 75%, MRS 35%. So when you look at the change in the anti problem pill level, it has a very abrupt decrease at the very beginning. After two weeks, the anti problem P decreased from, from um, 770 something to 550 something. After one year, it will decrease to around 400. So there's a, 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 about a 45% decrease in anti problem pill level during the study follow-up. And on the x-axis, you have a change in the anti-problem pill level. The y-axis very variable, various variables for cardiac remodeling. And if you have a great decrease in anti-problem pill level, ejection fraction increase here. Here on the very left, about 20%. LV end volume index, uh, LA volume index, systolic volume, they all decrease here with the decrease of anti problem P level during the follow up. When you're looking at the uh, EF uh, at the baseline, the EF was 28%, and after 12 months, it increased to, uh, it's increased by 9%. The LV end diastolic volume index decreased by 12%. And every ancestry volume index decreases by 50 milliliter per square meter by the surface. The LA volume index decreases by 7 uh, milliliter per square meter. So, in the ProVH study, uh, it shows that the largest reduction in anti problem P level and every ancestry volume by six months, this patient has the lowest. Um, lowest rate of a death or heart failure hospitalization. So the cardiac reverse remodeling is very, very important, and it provides a mechanics explanation for the effect of a sacrative sartan in half red patient. So what about the dosing in the real world? As you know, if you prescribe sacrative sartan, you will experience that many patients will have a hypertension. So what about the dose in the RCT or in RCT, in Pradam HF study, all patients were up titrated to the target dose. And in the secretive versatanam, about 40% had dose reduction during the follow up. And about 37% of this patient returned to the target dose. That means the two thirds remain had their lower, were on the lower dose than target. In the improved study, about 65% has a 200 milligram twice a day, the target dose. That means 35% had a dose less than the target during the follow-up. 
we look at the data in Korea and there were 400 patients, half red patients, and we looked how the dosing are in this patient at one year. About 24% had 200 milligrams twice a day, 28% had 100 milligrams twice a day, and 31% had 50 milligrams twice a day. So there is an Asia, uh, more than the, the majority of patients received lower dose. But when you look at the other clinical parameters, systolic blood PP decreased by 2.2 millimeter mercury, EG followed by 2.1. Ejection fraction increased by 10%, LV antacid volume index decreased by 18.7%, and anti program P level decreased by more than 50%. So using just low doses in Korea, we have the same effect in, as in the randomized clinical trial. I'm gonna to touch a little bit renal protection because since the SL2 inhibitor, heart failure patient also, um, or heart failure specialists are very interested in renal protection as well. So <clears throat> nitric peptide system, AMP, BMP, causes natural uresis and diuresis and vas dilator. It also has a receptor in the kidney. And we look at the kidney here, this is afferent atrial, this is the efferent atrial, this is macular densa, and this is the glomerular tubular apparatus. When you give the nitric peptide to the patient, it activates general cyclase, increase cyclic GMP level, and that inhibits the sodium reabsorption in proximal tubule. So <clears throat> this is the infusion of a AMP, and with the infusion, there's an increase in GFR here. So sodium exclusion also increases. So we have an increase in GFR, an increase in natriuresis and diuresis. So when you look at the uh, mechanism of the ester to inhibitor in uh, diabetic kidney disease, in normal kidney, you have a sodium glucose reabsorption in the proximal tubule via S32. If you have a diabetes, you have more glucose here in proximal tubule. So glucose will be reabsorbed along with sodium. So that you have less sodium in the distal tubule and in the macular density, you have a low sodium concentration. They will lead to the vasodilation via tubular glomerular feedback. When you give SL2 inhibitor to this patient, it just blocks here the, prox the sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule. Therefore, you have more sodium in the distal tubule and then restore tubule glomerular feedback. So in the, with the SL2 inhibitor, you have first drop in the GFR, but the slope of the <clears throat> GFR decreases it flatter then the placebo, arm, so you have a crossover after one or two years, so that you have survived, you have a more kidney protection after one and a half year. So this is a drug that work in nephron. So SJ2 inhibitor causes a afferent atrial vas constriction, lowers the intraglomerular pressure, ROS blocker dilates the efferent atrial. So you have a low prices here. So when you give sacrifice satan, you have a natid uresis like SA to inhibit the proximal tubule, and vasatan will act as a ROS inhibitor so that you have a kind of dual protection for the kidney. So it's a from Paragon study, when you're looking at the renal outcome, there is a 50% risk reduction for EJ for ESR or renal death in patients who are receiving sacrative bisatin, as in here in the couple of my survival group. As for the EGFR over time, there is an increase in EGFR, and these two slopes are parallel to each other so that you have less decrease in EGFR with the sacrative bisatin compared to bisatin alone. So let me summarize talk with this last slide. This is what to do or what not to message from the ESG guideline. And as you see here in the last line, 
Um, the succulent varsatan is recommended as a replacement for ACE inhibitor in patients with half pipe to reduce the risk of a heart failure hospitalization and death. It really emphasizes that this is currently the best half ref, um, one of the best half ref drugs that really improves the survivor compared to enalapril. I thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Thanks, uh, Jinju. That was indeed a two default review of the ANI class of drugs. So, um, any questions from the panel or my co chair, please uh, jump in. Um, if not, then maybe I can start out with one question before my co chair drops in. Um, in the guidelines, they say it's a, still a class 2B, but a class 1A to start ACE inhibitors. So, in your point of view, in the Asia Pacific context, there are so many zeros for the difference in terms of the p-value. What is then the use case for ACE inhibitor now? Because the drug was compared against enalapril and it shows dramatic improvement, not just in combined maze plus CV death. So why do you want to use ACE inhibitors where you can use sacopitril valsartan in Asia Pacific? Yes, this is a very good question. I don't know why the ESC guidelines still have ACE inhibitor and secretive varsatan at the same line. The consensus of the ACC and HHA, AHA, they recommend secretive varsatan as the first drug. And if you can't use this, you can use ACE inhibitor. And if you can't use secretive varsatan ACE inhibitor, then you can use ARB. I think we should use secretive varsatan as the first line drug for heart rate patient management. But the question is the cost because you know it's four times more expensive than an ACE inhibitor in most countries. So if the cost is not an issue, then you should start with the ACE uh, uh, secretive varsatan. And for those who in countries where secretive varsatan is not available or the care costs the issue, then you may start with AC inhibitor, but not with ARB. Thanks, Jinju. Uh, Dr. Lee, you have a question? Uh, yeah, a question regarding the dose of the uh, circuitry of asartan. In the trials, uh, more than around 50% of patients that are underdosed, I mean, less than 100 milligrams per day, twice per day. Uh, what do you think uh, about the dose and the beneficial effect of the army? Actually, there are studies that the higher dose, the better the outcome. But the one thing is that the paradigm age of study or other study were mostly carried out in Caucasian who has more BMI and more body weight at all, more body surface area. So we're not sure whether we can directly apply this result to Asian patients with the lower BMI and more lower body weight. The second issue is that uh, if you have a higher dose, then if you tolerate a higher dose, that means the patient is better conditioned than those patients who cannot tolerate the maximal tolerated dose. Let's say you have kind of selection bias. So we are not sure whether dose is the marker or the mediator of the drug, but you need to, you need to try to uptitrate the uh, up titrated dose, the max maximally tolerated dose or target dose, because we do not have data for the, uh, let's say, lower dose hypothesis or marker hypothesis. So I would try to up titrate dose to the maximally tolerated dose in the heart rate patient. I, I do have initially, before Dr. Lee Jami, also the same question about dose. We have in Asia a lot of patients who, because we give them a combination of many classes of drugs. They start out with 25 milligram BID, step up to 50. They really achieve dramatic improvement in NYHA class, BMP drop. They are very reluctant to increase dose actually. So are you saying that there's added dose increased benefits even if they have achieved improvement in NYHA class and BMP levels? The thing is that we don't have data. So we, we don't know. So if you look at the start, let's say, uh, they started with the cavedular, the recommended dose is 50 milligram a day or 25 milligram twice a day. The clinical trial, the mean dose in clinical trial is 37 milligram. So even in clinical trial, you can't reach the target dose. The same is for 
uh, by Satan in Bell Heft, the recommended dose was 30, 320 milligram, but in that study, 240 milligram was the mean dose. So you can't, you can't just target those in every patient, but you can do is you can up to the dose to the, to the, uh, to the maximum of the tolerate, maximum tolerating dose. Thanks. Any questions uh, for Dr. Uh, Park? Yeah, sure. Dr. Park, uh, you mentioned that uh, the RNA had renal protective effect. Uh, so do you have the threshold, uh, like how bad the renal function the patient has that you may hesitate to prescribe the medication for them? And also for the patient already on hemodialysis, do you recommend them to use the drug as well? Thank you. Yes, uh, this is a very good question because heart failure patient one third had renal, renal impairment. And uh, the patient with the, on HD were hemodialysis were excluded in the paradigm study or the on all, all other clinical trials. But with this drug more and more popular among heart failure patients, we have a data that on the use of it, the executive versatile in HD uh, on patient with the hemodialysis and they were as effective as the other group. So I don't see any concern why not to use this drug. You use the Vasatan in HD patient in all kinds of patient group. So in contrast to SA2 inhibitor, I don't see any threshold, EGFR threshold for secretary Vasatan. Thank you. Um, any last questions for Dr. Park? Maybe just the last one. You didn't go into normal or preserved ejection fraction for yes. ARNIs. Maybe you can give us a parting remark uh, on the ARNI use in HEPF. Um, uh, it's a very, very big, big complex issue. If you have a mid-range or the mildly reduced ejection fraction, let's say 40 to 50%, I'm sure that ARNI works. If you have ejection fraction greater than 50%, let's say between 50 and 55, 57, the drugs seem to work. Because in the Paragon study, there was a subgroup analysis, the median EF was 70, uh, 57%, and it was effective in patients who had ejection fraction less than 57%. And the FDA had an approval for, par for RNA in heart failure patients below normal ejection fraction because there were secondary analysis was the extended clinical outcome by including urgent heart failure visit. Because if you have a, uh, let's say, DAPA HF study, the clinical endpoint also included urgent heart failure visit, but in a Paragon study, you need to be hospitalized. So if you include the urgent heart failure visit, uh, then the P value becomes significant. And there was one of the reasons why FDA approved the uh, Sakuji Versata in heart failure with below normal ejection fraction. So we need more study, but I think you can use it for patients who have less than 55% ejection fraction. Yeah, but probably not more than that. Um, probably not more lot. than that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, Jinju. So we're gonna change tracks a little bit to Professor Rongroach to give an overview on the competing big class of drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors. Rongroach, please. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, uh, and uh, thank you uh, for introduction. Uh, I, uh, I will focus my talk on uh, the drug SGLT2 inhibitor as a frontline for heart failure patients, both with those preserve ejection fraction and written without diabetes. Uh, this outline of my talk, uh, diabetes and heart failure. Uh, and detail of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in uh, different group of patients and look at Asian data and uh, real world data. Uh, first of all, uh, as you listen to uh, Dr. Park earlier, you listen to the benefit of ANI in Paladam heart failure. Uh, in my talk, I will focus on SGLT2 inhibitor to the right. If you would look at the graph of the benefit of the drug, uh, you see that uh, the graph separate very early for both class of drug. For uh, SA2 inhibitor, the number needed to treat also 21. The p-value also very significant and the hazard ratio 
was 0 0.74. Uh, both uh, study use CV date and heart failure hospitalization as the composite endpoint. Now we are talking about two different class of drug uh, that have an emerging role in the treatment of patient uh, with heart failure. Uh, this is patient with heart failure with or without diabetes. So you will, uh, you know that the global prevalence of diabetes increase. Uh, the projection is from 2017 to 2045. The number will be at least 200 million people with diabetes more. And similarly for heart failure, uh, this is data from United States. You can project the increased prevalence of heart failure uh, up to 2000. 30 and maybe more. But this is mainly due to the increased size of elderly population and increased prevalence of heart failure. Uh, if you look at a study uh, of diabetes and study of heart failure, you see the prevalence of diabetes in patients with heart failure approximately 30%. Also, similarly, if you look at a study of diabetes, you see the prevalence of heart failure in diabetes patients also around 10 to 20 percent. It's a huge number of population that overlap between diabetes and heart failure. When you have diabetes, you have a good chance of developing heart failure in the future, approximately two to five four. And when you develop heart failure, you have increased risk of mortality and recurrent heart failure. The expected survival significantly decrease, but uh, today, we're not talking about diabetes with heart failure. We're talking about heart failure with and without diabetes. Actually, heart failure is the very common presentation of cardiovascular disease in patients with diabetes. Uh, mechanism of SAT2 inhibitor. The drug increased glucose excretion in the proximal tubule. And when doing so, they not only affect the volume status of the patient, but they also affect cardiovascular risk reduction, glucose lowering, weight loss by approximately two kilo, systolic blood pressure lowering by approximately four millimeter mercury, left nuclear hypertrophy regression and reduction of albuminuria by 30 to 40%. This is a reduction in cardiovascular risk factor and may have impact on the reduction of both heart failure and CV death in the future. This is evidence of SD2 inhibitor in the reduction of left ventricular hypertrophy. This is experimental in dapagliforcin between uh, the drug and placebo. You will see that left ventricular hypertrophy assessed by cardiac MR markedly uh, reduced after. 12 months of the drug. Also, the drug has been shown to decrease lung fluid volume. This is a by defined heart failure study. Uh, study uh, more than 200 patient diabetes, random to DAPA versus placebo for uh, 12 months. Uh, the drug significantly reduced uh, lung fluid volume. And this uh, can reflect to the reduction in NT pro BNP level and quality of life. In animal model, uh, SGA2 inhibitor has been shown to affect a decrease intracellular sodium and calcium. Therefore, the drug will balance calcium regulation within cell and reduction of the injury cell injury causing by calcium overload. In clinical trial, the drug significantly increased hematocrit level. And from the calculation, they proposed that the change in hematocrit increase uh, is, uh, can explain about 50% of cardiovascular death reduction and also uh, the reduction of heart failure. The drug have differential effect on interstitial and intravascular water. In contrary to loop diuretic, loop diuretic decreased 
interstitial and intravascular volume, but SA2 inhibitor significantly reduce interstitial volume, but no effect on intravascular volume. Uh, this is the drug that can explain the, also the benefit in heart failure reduction and, and uh, renal benefit of SA2 inhibitor. Now for the treatment of heart failure reduced ejection fraction, uh, the cardiovascular outcome study in diabetes that have to be proved that the drug have no problem on CV date or major CV outcome. The drug has been found not only to decrease the reduction in mass, but also significantly reduction in hospitalization due to heart failure, both EMPA, Kana, and Dabagliposin. This is uh, the initial study before uh, the drug uh, has been uh, tested in patients with heart failure. There are a lot of room for improvement in the treatment of heart failure, reduce ejection fraction, as you uh, can uh, hear that uh, we have many new drugs for the treatment of heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, but the residual risk remain high. This is after the implementation of ACI beta blocker, and even with ANI, both treatment arm and placebo arm also have a high one-year mortality rate and high one-year hospitalization rate. Uh, I will show you the data on emperor reduce and DAPA. DAPA heart failure announced ESC uh, 2019 and emperor reduce in uh, ESC 2020. This is number of patient follow up time, primary outcome. Similarly, but DAPA also include urgent heart failure visit, ejection fraction less than 40 uh, with high antibody level and EGFR more than 30 for DAPA, more than 20 for EMPA. The proportion of diabetes in both trials is around 50%. DAPA is around 42%. Ejection fraction around 27, and probability almost 2,000. Uh, both, uh, both studies have a good proportion of patients receiving guideline-directed medical treatment, including including ANI. Uh, this is the data, the primary endpoint reduction by 25% for Emperor and 26% for DAPA. Uh, heart failure hospitalization reduced by 30% for Emperor and 25% for DAPA. And composite renal outcome reduced significantly for both, uh, for EMPA, but not for DAPA, even uh, the renal outcome decrease. The benefit across all subgroup and excellent safety profile for both drug compared possible, not only reduce composite outcome, they also uh, found to have a reduction in atrial fibrillation with SLT2 inhibitor from meta-analysis. And when you use the drug in combination with MRA, the incidence of severe or moderate hyperkalemia reduced by approximately half when you implement the SL2 inhibitor in combination with MRE. And for the reason uh, of uh, the DAPA, DAPA heart failure study, FDA approved DAPA uh, in May 2020 for the use of heart failure reduced ejection fraction with and without type 2 diabetes. Uh, the data for diabetes and non-diabetes. For DAPA uh, heart failure, you see the benefit in diabetes group and non-diabetes group is similar. Hazard ratio 0 0.75 and 0 0.73. Uh, and this is worsening heart failure event. Uh, similar benefit for diabetes and non-diabetes. Hazard ratio 0 0.77 and 7, 0 0.62. We know benefit also similar for diabetes and non-diabetes hazard ratio 0 0.73 and 0 0.67. Uh, it has been published by McMurray and Milton Packer that the sequence, the original sequence should be changed. 
due to the drug, the three class of drug, NCI, ARB, beta blocker, MI, uh, need titration and need to be one by one or one combination and take time before uh, the drug achieve guideline recommendation dose for the three class of drug. They propose a new sequence and start and add new medication every two weeks. And step three, four weeks, you have the three, the four class of drug together. This is a purpose and it has been changed in the guideline, especially ESC guideline that uh, just announced uh, two, uh, two months ago. SCA2 inhibitor not only have the role for treatment, but also for prevention. The data from DECLARE study, Dabaki Fosin, which uh, this study have 60% is risk factor without documented cardiovascular disease. Uh, the data show that CV death hospitalization reduced by SA2 inhibitor by 17% significant p value for superiority. And when you look at patient in risk factor group without cardiovascular disease, the drug has been shown to have a significant reduction in heart failure in the future and also have benefit in the renal outcome. Uh, it has been announced during the ESC right after uh, ESC guideline uh, announced for emperor preserve. As you are aware that for patient with heart failure preserve ejection fraction, there is no specific class of that that have a significant impact in cardiovascular outcome of the patient. The drug that have benefit for heart failure reduced have been uh, study with halfway preserved, but also negative try. Emperor preserve is the first try that have uh, that check the light in halfway preserved ejection fraction. This is phase three in patient with uh, halfway preserved ejection fraction EF more than forty uh, with uh, elevated anti proven P have uh, the primary composite endpoint is uh, CV date and heart failure hospitalization EMPA versus placebo average for up 26 months, baseline corrective diabetes, seven of uh, 49% in both group. New York heart functional class two mainly 80%. Average NT probability P around nine, almost 1,000 atrial fibrillation, 50%. GFR average of 50, uh, of uh, 60 uh, have a, uh, receive a standard medication. The data in this study show that the composite outcome reduced by hazard ratio of 0 0.79, uh, the p-value 0 0.0003, and hardly hospitalization reduced with the hazard ratio 0 0.73, p-value less than 0 0.001 for imperfect dysfunction. Uh, comparing to placebo in half a preserved ejection fraction, if you look at individual composite outcome, CV date has a ratio 0 0.91, not significant reduction. The main primary outcome benefit is driven by half a hospitalization with this very significant impact on the outcome in this group. Uh, look at interaction between diabetes and no diabetes. No interaction, which means that also the benefit in diabetes and no diabetes is similar. Look at uh, race, Asian population and white population, similar benefit, the trend toward a little more benefit in Asian population. Jeff are more than or less than 60 similar benefit. Ejection fraction. Uh, there's no significant interaction with mean that uh, have no significant interaction on ejection fraction that even there's a trend toward less benefit in patient with very good ejection fraction. Uh, cause of heart failure have no significant difference. Uh, New York heart also the same and anti P use of standard medication also no significant interaction on the benefit of MPA in patient with uh, reduced and uh, and this is a three p specified composite endpoint. Uh, you see that the primary endpoint reduced by twenty one percent, and uh, half of the hospital reduced by twenty seven. 
GFR decline, slope GFR decline also significantly reduced with, uh, with the P value less than 0 0.0001. Benefit of uh, SGA2 in heart failure, the data in patient with reduced ejection fraction, you see the benefit in Asia versus white, P interaction 0 0.01. Uh, there's a trend toward more benefit in Asia population from the data of DAPA, Hasbury, and Emperor reduce. And also, as I showed you earlier for preserve, there's no second interaction for benefit in Asian population in preserve as well. The guideline is CC guideline 2021. Recommend any the one that uh, Professor Park mentioned, ANI is the first line and prefer over ACI or ARB. Uh, the SCL2 inhibitor is this one. Uh, after this one, you add SCLG2 in patient meet GFR criteria functional class two to four, uh, or, or the, you can have uh, the fraud drug because after, right after you have this one, you can add this one. For ESC guideline, 2021, the, this is uh, the four class of the drug together as class one recommendation, and then you can uptitrate the drug later. For SH2 inhibitor, you have no need for uptitration, single dose, and uh, you can just initiate the drug. Uh, Professor McNally proposed the five pillar of heart failure reduce. Uh, five pillar, but four pill. You can have uh, any beta blocker, MRA, and this is inhibitor all together. Uh, recent publication last month dropped layering in heart failure. As you heard, many questions you which one, which drug you start first, and how to manage patient uh, when you diagnose heart failure, reduce ejection fraction. This study. Proposed patient profile relevant to drug layering according to heart rate, blood pressure, and the presence or absence of atrial fibrillation. They propose that you can start this for group of drugs, but you start which drug first or try to uh, titrate the dose of medication, which one uh, first, and how to caution. You look at blood pressure, low blood pressure, low, uh, low blood pressure, low heart rate. And normal blood pressure or high heart rate, you use uh, this one. Uh, for the present of atrial fibrillation, you can add, you can uh, focus on anti deteriorate anticholine, atrial fibrillation, low blood pressure, normal heart rate, normal blood pressure. This is a good uh, recommendation. Propose uh, how you uh, look at patient phenotype and uh, start uh, which group of patient and how to try to it. The paper also recommends that renal dysfunction and abnormal potassium should be emphasized on every step of initiation or titration of medication. We have level data for uh, comparing SU2 inhibitor versus standard medication of diabetes. We are waiting for more reliable data on the use of SU2 inhibitor uh, for patients with heart failure reduced or preserved because the drug is just approved by FDA for this indication. Uh, the reliable data for diabetes uh, comparing for uh, EMPA with other class, for example, DP4 inhibitor for a large group of patients, uh, you see that the drug comparing to DP4 have benefit in the reduction of composite outcome uh, for mortality and for especially for heart failure with a hazard ratio of uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. Also for DAPA glyphosate in the CBD real study compared to uh, other class of medication or DP4, the drug has been shown in real world to reduce ma major adverse cardiac event, reduce heart failure and also reduce mortality. This is uh, not only in Western population, also in Asian population. So uh, for summary, SU2 inhibitor is a class of drugs that have benefit uh, in patients with heart failure with and without diabetes. And the data 
we have the new data that not only reduce ejection fraction, but also for preserve ejection fraction. More data is coming for deliver in patient with DAPA kifosin in preserve ejection fraction. Therefore, SA2 inhibitor have benefit in patient with the DM document cardiovascular disease and heart failure reduce. And now we have the data increase of ejection fraction. And now in the past 30 year, we have many class of drug that have benefit in the reduction of mortality and heart failure in patient with heart failure reduce ejection fraction and we have data increase of as well. Now, after implementation of SCRT2 inhibitor, mortality reduction total in combination with other guideline directed medication treatment will be reduced by uh, 70 to 80%. This is an exciting moment in heart failure field. Two new treatments, ANI and SCRT2 inhibitor has been found to have benefit in patients with heart failure, reduce ejection fraction, reduce uh, composite endpoints in patients with preserved ejection fraction. The challenge for us is to bring this medication into practice. We must not take excuse for not using the benefit that have been shown to have a reduction or improvement in cardiovascular outcome. Our patients need them and the patient need them now. The benefit occur very early. You just need to initiate the drug for appropriate patient. For it to, to inhibit it, you have, need no titration. And the term stable heart failure should not be used because there are no such patients that have stable heart failure. The patient with stable heart failure can have exacerbation of heart failure anytime. Thank you very much for attention. Thanks, Ron Roach. Again, a very excellent tour de force. So we have two blockbusters head to head. It's almost like a debate between Jinju and Ron Roach, actually. So um, any questions from my panel first before I jump in? Anyone want to raise a query? Uh, I just want to ask a quick question. Do you think uh, the the, uh, the SGLT2 has class effects, I meaning all of the SGLT2 has the same effect and benefit? Uh, from the uh, initial data in both animal and human study for mechanism that a patient try, uh, that people try to explain, all SGLT2 inhibitor seem uh, to have similar action on fluid status on uh, glycosuria, yeah. on change in cardiovascular risk factors. Therefore, it is, uh, it is possible that it can be class effect, but in the recommendation, in the guideline, uh, they based on evidence from clinical trial that has to be proof that the drug have benefit uh, in such patient. Therefore, in the guideline, for example, ESC guideline, they just mentioned DAPA and EMPA for heart failure reduced. They do not mention just the whole class of drug, although it is reasonable that the drug may be class effect. As example for other drugs, such as soloist and SCORE, uh, in patients with SOTA kisphosin, they also study patient diabetes and heart failure. They also have the data in patients with preserved and reduced, but only for diabetes patients that shown to have a benefit in the reduction of event. Therefore, uh, I believe that it may be class effect, but for recommendation or follow guideline, you have to focus on the data from clinical trial. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the panelists? A very short question regarding the EMPA preserved. How about the, because we have the more beneficial effect in terms of the Asia population for the half failure with the preserved ejection fraction. Do you think that's because of the half puff in Asian people are more obesity? I believe that this could be a possible reason Many studies shown that heart failure in Asia have a uh, different or unique entity 
comparing to Western population, this is both reduced and preserved, especially for preserved ejection fraction. You see that uh, Asian population have a presentation of heart failure more early than Western population. And the heart failure may be problem in Asia uh, from the population size, maybe more burden comparing to Western population. I think that uh, it is the possible that Asian population have a unique entity of heart failure preserved ejection fraction. And this is uh, waiting for more study. Yeah. Thank you. Any other, Siwi? Uh, yeah, I have a question. I think this is very well uh, established that all these heart failure medicines do have very benefit effects, both on mortality and uh, morbidities. Do you think that one of the uh, challenges we have is putting patients on so many medicines, a benefit of doing poorly, uh, what I call combination drug that will definitely improve compliance and what are your thoughts and whether there's anything in the pipeline? Just combining, you know, four drugs into one, yeah, I, I, I think that this is a very good idea uh, for, uh, for combination drug or a single pill of uh, drug combination. Uh, but uh, the main problem uh, that has been shown that a single pill combination has been used uh, effectively, especially in patients with hypertension, right? But for patients with heart failure, the problem is mainly for the dose of medication for standard medication. Uh, A, C, I, A, R, B, R, N, E, beta broker, you have very wide range of the dose of medication. You have to try to add the medication, where, uh, especially when you have low blood pressure, you use, use with very low dose and uh, slowly up titration. It would be a little difficult to make a single pill with different dose of medication. You mean it, it, it will be, it have to be many, many strings of medication in combination. Uh, the, this, uh, the concept is well taken for SDI2 inhibitor because SDI2 inhibitor, you have single dose, you need no titration, but the problem will be when you combine the guideline directed medication with uh, SDI2, uh, that would be very difficult for single pill uh, in the concept for uptitration of uh, uh, uptitration of medic medication. It would be challenge, I think. Thanks. So I maybe have, I can help. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Sorry I, I would have thought that giving uptitration phase is not ideal, but when it's stable, yeah. it is really a good idea yeah. because you know. Um, uh, it will definitely help with compliance and possibly driving the cost down because you know having one drug probably we can argue that as a group we can yeah. you know give a bit of a, a yeah. pressure. Well, it's all to benefit patients. Yeah, when you have stable dose, it's very good option. And and, and in Asian population, I think we need more data on cost effective or cost utility analysis of of, of the new medication. Yeah. So maybe a, a last question for Jinju, if you can uh, chip in here. Uh, we heard both pieces, you looked at NT, pro BNP. In the clinical practice, how low should you try to up-titrate drugs to target and push down the BNP? What levels, is it absolute percentage reduction or absolute level that you're targeting for in clinical practice? Uh, this is a very fast concept to titrate your drug according to BNP level, but the concept has failed. <laughs> So that I would not, I would use anti-proving P level to diagnose heart failure, not to monitor the response to medical therapy, uh, because uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work yet. So you uptight your drug uh, to the guideline take the medical uh, to the maximum tolerance dose, but not according to BMP level. But if you follow the BMP and there's decrease in BMP level, you can guess that the patient's doing well or not well. And I think I don't use BMP level for, for monitoring of a drug effect in my clinical practice. Thank you, Jinju. Uh, last question for Rong Roach. In a patient with CKD, maybe stage three, would, would you actually start both uh, ARNI as well as SGLT2 inhibitor at the same time if you're treating a heart failure patient? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I think that uh, we can start both drugs, 
um, at the same time in CKD stage three, and we follow them closely and monitor uh, both kidney function and uh, and uh, electrolyte uh, because once you start this drug, you need to follow patient uh, at least uh, the first week after you start and monitor uh, this. Uh, um, monitor kidney function and electrolyte. Uh, you can see from both clinical trials that the benefit of both drugs occur very, very early. Uh, in a matter of 10 to 20 days, you have a significant reduction of even. Uh, you, uh, I believe that uh, you don't need to wait time for to see the benefit. And whenever you have opportunity, you can uh, start, you can, uh, uh, unless the patient have very really low blood pressure, you have to be cautioned when you use any. If the patient have good blood pressure, you can start uh, them at the, uh, at the same time. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Prong Rocha. I would now like to transit uh, to session two and have Professor Lee uh, introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for not for the previous speakers talked about the SGT2I and the RNA. Then we move to the next one. That's the will be presented by Dr. Yu, and the title the AV ab junction ablation plus CRT versus case ablation re reason control in a half value still suggestion pressure complicated with the uh, persistent atrial fibrillation from Castle APA CRT to the real world. Dr. Yu, please. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor Lee, for kind introduction. Today, my task is to uh, uh, compare the strategies of AV junction ablation plus CRT versus catheter ablation recent control in half ref patient and persistent AF. Uh, before I jump into uh, the two trials, I'd like to uh, spend one minute talking about the interplay between heart failure and AF. First, they share uh, many uh, risk factors, including age, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and ischemia. Um, second, many patients with heart failure uh, develop AF later, and the AF itself can cause heart failure through high heart rates. And third, the vicious cycle. The existence of anyone will worsen the condition of another. The development of AF in heart failure doubles on mortality, and the development of heart failure in patients with AF is associated with threefold rising mortality. So, in castle AF, the hypothesis is to prove the catheter ablation for AF can improve outcomes among patients with heart failure. Uh, in this patient, uh, the, uh, in this study, the patients uh, with symptomatic paroxysmal or persistent AF were enrolled, and the patient had to have uh, ejection fraction below 35%. The results uh, of this study is uh, very impressive that uh, almost 40% of the risk reduction of the primary endpoint, uh, which is uh, death or hospitalization for heart failure. Um, this result uh, uh, was equally driven by uh, either death from any cause or hospitalization for heart failure. So uh, I think AF ablation uh, also of a primary and secondary clinical endpoints. Other than death and heart failure hospitalization, you can see here, the CV death and CV hospitalization are also reduced significantly. So um, I think for a patient with uh, AF and half, half ref, uh, the AF ablation should be attempted if no other indication. But uh, it's, there's actually a criterion that had not been paid attention to in the enrollment criteria. Uh, that is the patient has to be fail or intolerance of anti-arrhythmic drug therapy. Uh, this actually reminds us the 
uh, a recent East FNET4 trial that published last year in NGM that when the patient could tolerate antiarrhythmic drugs and are uh, diagnosed early, meaning uh, within 12 months, uh, the patient would uh, can benefit. The patient can actually benefit from reason control therapy, either by drug or ablation. Um, and uh, also in EAST trial, we can see uh, in, even in the reason control group, in the beginning, only 8% of the patient received ablation. And at the end of the study, at the two year, uh, only 20% of the patient received uh, ablation. So this is meaning that most of the patient could uh, tolerate antiarrhythmic drugs and it can be well controlled by these drugs. And among this trial, there were um, a small group of patients with low ejection fraction, around 10 to 15%. And because of the, uh, uh, the smaller number, you can see on the right-hand side that the p-value is uh, 0.12. Uh, but still you can see the trend that uh, early reason control can uh, help the patient for uh, risk re reduction. So um, from, the, uh, from the EAST and the CASEL trial, we should uh, reason control a patient with drugs if tolerated or if they cannot tolerate a drug, we can try ablation. But uh, this finding is interestingly uh, very similar to the subgroup analysis in Castle AF, showing that uh, the patient with uh, a New York Heart Association functional class two can actually benefit more than class three. And the patient with a higher uh, ejection fraction can benefit than lower. Uh, this implies that we may want to treat the patient um, early and timing. Another um, thing is that uh, in the Castle AF, uh, people criticized that uh, during the enrollment period, up to 87% of the patient are, uh, were actually excluded from uh, the study. So we may wonder whether the results could be generalized to a clinical practice. So um, last year, uh, there was an interesting paper using a large uh, US database and uh, identify the patient with AF and the heart failure patient. And you can see um, uh, in, the, in this cohort, only 70% of the patient would be eligible for the CASEL using the CASEL AF criteria. So it's just a minority of the real world population. And also you can see the benefit is around 20%, um, much less than the CASEL AF showed, uh, but uh, is there's actually a significant benefit from uh, the cohort. And if you compare the figure on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, you can see the curve is very similar. So you might say the result of Castle AF can be generalized to uh, most of the patients in the real world. So, um, Another interesting is that uh, even though in the CASEL AF patient, when they enroll a patient, the patient has to be like uh, intolerate to antiarrhythmic drugs. But you can see in the table that at the end of the final follow-up, there are like one third of the patient in both groups 
uh, taking antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, even though in the beginning they are uh, claimed they don't, they are not tolerant. So uh, I think that is because um, uh, in the protocol that the effort, uh, uh, even in the uh, pharmacological group, they uh, recommend the, um, the uh, PI to uh, try to maintain sinus reason uh, in, even in the control group. So uh, for the patient who uh, had failed atrial fibrillation, uh, meaning uh, they don't want to do the ablation or they had failed atrial fibrillation with early recurrence, what we should do next? Uh, usually I think we will give medications for rate control, uh, either beta blocker or digoxin. Uh, even though uh, the, these drugs do not sh show survival benefit in the uh, clinical trials. Uh, we actually do not have many choices. For those patients, uh, rate control is inadequate. We can, we then put a pacemaker and ablate the AV junction. The concern is the ultragenic ventricular dyssynchrony that created by traditional RV pacing. So maybe physiological or biventricular pacing can compensate the detrimental RV pacing. So now let's look at the APAF CRT mortality trial. The inclusion criteria is the uh, symptomatic permanent AF, meaning uh, lasting more than six months, uh, either considered unsuitable for AF ablation or who had done uh, ablation but failed. Another cr inclusion criteria is uh, the patient has to be hospitalization for heart failure in the previous year, but uh, they don't uh, set the criteria of LV ejection fraction. In this study, there are uh, 140 patients randomized. Uh, you can, uh, either to ablation and CRT arm or drug arm. You can uh, see here that uh, among the 75, uh, 75 patients, there were actually 18 patients, almost 25% uh, of patients cross over to ablation and the CRT. So, um, this uh, may dilute the effect of this study. So uh, if we, the outcome shows significant benefit uh, risk reduction of all cause death and or hospitalization for heart failure. If we uh, further look at the patient with reduced ejection fraction, we can, um, of course, the uh, uh, case number is because it's divided. Now the case number is even smaller. So in the patient with ejection fraction below 35, uh, the difference become uh, no significant, but uh, you can still see the trend that the group uh, of ablation and the pace uh, can reduce the uh, primary composite. Uh, endpoint. So um, the benefit of these two trials in Castle AF, I would say it's more clear that uh, uh, because we avoid the potential toxicity of the antiarrhythmic drugs by using ablation to try to maintain sinus rhythm. But in APEF CRT trial, it, the mechanism would be more complex because uh, comparing the two trials, uh, the study group had more strict rate control, better rate regular regularity, and also they use biventricular pacing. So you don't know uh, which is the main factor that drive the benefit of this treatment strategy. So the question is, uh, if we can get 
good rate control or good regularity just by medication. Is it still better to perform AV junction ablation with biventricular pacing? Or what would happen if we use the currently hot topic about his bundle pacing or a left bundle branch pacing? The data would be the same. Uh, we don't know uh, uh, yet. So uh, this is the picture of the AF spectrum, the natural course from uh, paroxysmal to persistent, then go to long-standing, persistent, and permanent. Of course, the patient uh, with treatment, uh, the patient with persistent AF can go back to paroxysmal, and it is common in the uh, clinical practice. So in the East FNET trial, we, we can uh, say for the patient in the uh, early stage, we would try to reason control with either medication or ablation as, as early as possible. Uh, but most of the patient would fall into this category that the patient either paroxysmal or persistent or long-standing, they can try to uh, do ablation to help maintain sinus reason. But for the patient who had failed ablation or uh, don't like to receive ablation, they can try to uh, ablate the AV junction and implant CRT for PACE. So uh, this, let's look this uh, common scenario in the clinic. Uh, if there's a 73-year-old man came to your office and uh, he had non-atrial fibrillation for five years and had progressive heart failure symptoms for the last year, what would be your recommendation? Um, I think I would probably do the echo first to see his atrial and ventricular condition. The echo data said uh, there's a reduced ejection fraction uh, with uh, enlarged left atrium. So if you are considering castle AF, then you would recommend PV isolation. Or because the AF history has long, very long, more than five years, we may recommend uh, AV junction ablation with CRT. But uh, actually, if we, uh, we now know that with CASO AF criteria, the patient has to be intoler intolerance or failure to antiarrhythmic drug therapy. So for this patient, we may try to use the drug uh, first to see whether he, it, can, uh, it can tolerate. Or for the, the second strategy, the patient may try to do AF ablation first, but uh, of course you can say, oh, it's all, almost a long-standing AF. It may not be responsive to ablation, but uh, still you can try before you do AV junction ablation. So if the patient uh, doesn't want to do any invasive study, still it's always okay to go back to the guideline directed medical treatment. Uh, the ESC and ACC both uh, announced new guidelines for heart failure in this year. And uh, also from the two uh, previous experts, we know that the drug is very uh, promising and maybe tried first. And actually those drugs, both ARNI and SGLT2 has some evidence showing that the AF burden can be reduced by this medication. So here is the, my conclusion that um, the treatment strategy has to be individualized according to the patient's age, comorbidity, and his own, his own preference. Um, AF ablation can avoid uh, antiarrhythmic drug toxic toxicity and serves as a good alternative to help maintain sinus reason in half rep patients. And pace and ablate strategy 
uh, showed beneficial effect on mortality and hospital hospitalization in half ref and permanent AF patients. However, uh, for me, I think more questions had raised from this study. I think we need more uh, data to jump to the conclusion. Thank you. Thanks for a nice presentation from Professor Yu. Uh, this is open for discussion. Any question from the panel or from the group? Can I start off with a quick question for Cheryl? Um, you mentioned on that big topic, your patient, for example, is showed with heart failure and you said maybe you can go with antiarrhythmic drugs. I mean, ESE say that this patient probably is not suitable for drugs like Sotolol with uh, poor ejection fraction. And the anti arrhythmic drug that comes to mind will be amiodarone, which long-term is not a good drug to use. So what anti arrhythmic drugs are we talking about in this day and age for chronic AF? Uh, so uh, because today's uh, uh, we talk patient with half ref. So you are right that in this uh, population, the only uh, good anti arrhythmic drug was, anti, uh, was amiodarone. But as you said that there's long-term, uh, there's complication if you use long-term. So uh, for this patient, I would just try a short-term amiodarone. And then if the reason uh, doesn't uh, convert, I would recommend ablation to try to uh, convert the reason. I would not use amiodarone for long-term. We know that the uh, amiodarone is uh, not a very good can candidate uh, agent for long-term control of atrial uh, fibrillation. And uh, there are so many questions regarding the persistent uh, or permanent, permanent AF. Also, some questions regarding the either biventricular pacing or from his bundle pacing. And uh, since there are so many uncertainties, so would you have any suggestion that uh, how to individualize this kind of patient. I mean, of course, in the early stage, the Parsons atrial fibrillation, I think medication is a good idea at first, but for persistent AF or even permanent AF, that I tell you, if we define it as a failure from previous ablation, then would you suggest straightforward to have a more aggressive ablation and by ventricular pacing? Um, because uh, I think there are some issues to be considered. Uh, first, uh, if we do the uh, AV junction ablation, we will make this patient become pacemaker dependent. Sure. Actually, in some situation, that would be very dangerous for this patient. For example, if the device become infected, you have to remove and implant a temporary pacemaker. So sure. I personally would uh, put this strategy at the very, very last, uh, like a reservoir. And uh, like I said, I think there are uh, many questions to be answered. For example, whether I would give CRT or I would give a left bundle pacing. For now, I don't have the answer. So I would not be comfortable to recommend this strategy early for the uh, uh, patients. And, uh, but uh, for those patients with half ref and permanent AF, I would, um, I would recommend uh, ablation trial first. So you mean ablation of atrial fibrillation, but not the AV node, am yes. I right? Okay. Yes. And you would, would put on the biometric pacing in early stage. As uh, the ESC guideline, based on ESC guideline 2021, 20, 20, the CRT for those dependent on pacing is a uh, move the upgrade. Oh, uh, uh, if the patient is already uh, pacemaker dependent and already RV pacing dependent, mm -hmm. uh, and then the effect ejection fraction dropped below 35%. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's, um, it's, I guess it's class one indication to up, uh, no, class 2A Great. indication to upgrade to CRT, yes. Mm -hmm. But it will be hesitated for the AV node ablation, right? 
uh, yeah, I, I really uh, hesitate to damage the AV junction. Okay. I, yeah, I have seen question. some patients that work quite well uh, with uh, just a blading as a last resort and do a CRTD. Uh, some of them have done incredibly well. Can I just ask uh, uh, you guys, whether Rong Roach or yourself, uh, the some group who are older, whether it's half path or half ref and they have AF, what is the age threshold for ablation nowadays? Is there one? Do, do you stop ablating when they are 70, 75 or age doesn't play a part anymore? Yeah, yeah. I think age is very important for a physician to recommend a, a strategy to a patient. So I don't think there is a gold standard, but for my own, my personal practice, I would set like 80 as a cut. <laughs> Uh, so if we, the patient are uh, above 80, I would recommend pacemaker more. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it uh, depends on the functional status and uh, yes. quality of life of the patient as well. It's not only uh, the age. If the yeah. patient yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes. spend their active life, their brain is okay, maybe you, we can, we can uh, run invasive strategy as well. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. So we are le much left behind. We have to move to the next uh, speaker. That's uh, Dr. Hu from Singapore. The, the, the presentation is entitled The, the Functional Mitral Regurgitation and the Outcome in Half Fair with Reduced Ejection Pressure, the Implication in Patient Selection for Mitral Clip Therapy. Uh, Dr. Hu, please. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee, for the introduction. And I, I thank the committee for um, inviting me. And I think this is a very in interesting uh, uh, meeting for me, learning from all different colleagues and really truly representing what I call heart team. And um, this is my uh, disclosure. I just want to say that I'm a imager and not a heart failure specialist, but I'll go do my best to just give you an overview of functional mitral regurgitation, how we should manage them. I think just a quick overview on mitral valve apparatus is very complex and very dynamic. In fact, it has got so many components and more importantly, in res with respect to our today's talk, is the fact that the left ventricle is the one that is abnormal. Sometimes just that being the case, um, we have had difficulty because the mitral valve, because of the uh, geometry of left ventricle remodeling, uh, even though the mitral valve leaflet is normal, it can cause mitral regurgitations. And typically, we see that in terms of carpentier classification, that of type 3B classifications of functional uh, dysfunction of the mitral valve apparatus, as well as at the same time with chronic mitral regurgitation and annular dilatations. The key problem of functional mitral regurgitation in patients with heart failure is truly that of leaflet tattering. And that's because of what you see here in the right panel where the left ventricle is very poor, the ventricular remodeling, head muscle displacement, causing tattering of the mitral valve leaflet, resulting in mitral valve malcoaptations, resulting in mitral regurgitations. Two types of tattering patterns we see. One is that of asymmetrical tattering due to regional left ventricular remodeling, typically seen in posterior myocardial infarctions where the coaptation point is at the atrial surface of the posterior leaflet, causing posterior leaflet restrictions. And sometimes when we see this, we can mistake this as an anterior prolapse. It's actually a pseudo prolapse of the anterior leaflet and the mitral valve coaptation do not go beyond the annulus. That's why it is not a degenerative mitral regurgitation. Typically in this case, you get regurgitation uh, uh, jet that is very eccentric, posteriorly directed. The other common case that we see is a symmetrical tattering, that of a LV global uh, remodeling, where you have dilatation as well as uh, symmetrical uh, tattering of the mitral valve, resulting in severe mitral regurgitation that is directed centrally along the coaptation. Because of the chronic uh, functional mitral regurgitation or any sort of mitral regurgitation, you can have atrial fibrillations, and that is well described by previous speaker. And in this case, you can have very marked mitral annular dilatation in the presence of severe mitral regurgitation as well as atrial fibrillation. And you can have eccentric uh, mitral regurgitation as well because of the deviation of the posterior uh, annulus. All said, pathophysiology or FMR is really very challenging. There is a degree of leaflet tattering, whether it is uh, mild to severe, and the MR is dynamic. At the same time, really, it is a uh, 
interplay between the reduced uh, closing forces because of uh, the poor LB function as well as increased tattering forces because of the geometry of the LB. So this interplay results in degree of mitral regurgitation that is hard to predict. In fact, the mitral valve tattering has been described and has implications in terms of success of mitral valve annuloplasty, and it has been well described. Particular for mitral cleat edge to edge repair that is important for our talk today is the fact that we have to analyze really what is the morphology of the mitral valve. It's usually that is extent of uh, uh, tattering, the cooperation gap as, as well as the cooperation length is important. Also, in the long axis of the TE, we want to look at the leaflet. As a uh, length, because it has implications for the type of uh, uh, mitral fluid that you put in, as well as whether there is any leaflet classifications or the baseline mitral valve gradient. We all know now that when it comes to definition of severe functional mitral regurgitations, the cutoff is the same as for the primary mitral regurgitation, at least in American guidelines. And this is the EROA of more than 40 or regurgitation fractions of more than 50%. To make the diagnosis a little bit more challenging for functional mitral regurgitation when it comes to assessments of severity is the fact that it is very dynamic, especially in the FMR. In loading conditions, hypertensive state can cause more worsening of MR, looks like the MR is more severe. Patients who have low blood pressure or uh, under sedation, such as during TE, is actually much more reduced, so you may underestimate MR severity. Best to, say, best to say that transthoracic echoes is what we use for assessment of severity, whereas for transesophageal, we are using it best to uh, assess the mechanism of MR to exclude degenerative causes, for example. Sometimes the good medical therapy, as previous speakers have spoken about, reverse remodeling does help, and we have to optimize medical therapy, and then we assess the micro regurgitations. At the same time, sometimes exercise to review the symptoms of the patients, although the exercise um, stress echo do not specifically has got very much uh, diagnostic, uh, um, has got not much management plan, although to say that these patients will be more brittle and we have to closely monitor that. In terms of the uh, outcomes for patients with FMI, I think this is well spoken uh, a lot uh, for the, from the previous speaker, so I shan't delve too much into it. Suffice to say, EROA of more than 0.2 or 20 millimeters square seems to suggest that the patients will have worse outcome, whether because of the MR per se or because of the LV dysfunctions. We are not sure. What is the current record, um, uh, outcome data shows in the contemporary patients? Just looking at the mitral FR as well as co-op study that include patients of contemporary uh, patients that has got majority of them on medical therapy that includes the three pillars, maybe not the SGLT2, um, uh, that shows that 30 to 40% will actually die in two years. In fact, in the co-op, about 40 to 50% will die after three years. So it's actually a huge mortality problems in patients with functional MR. So in this context, Probably reducing the MR helps with the reverse remodeling and reduce the MR may perhaps increase or uh, change the prognosis of the patients. You know as well that from the surgical data, it's quite disappointing in terms, in terms of mitral valve repair as replacement. The edge to edge repair using the transcatheter method without open heart surgery using the click methods in the uh, percutaneous manner does seems to help, especially if you have the, the data from the co op. Here, I would like to discuss the two uh, studies that included in terms of randomized study that in uh, mitral funds as well as for up trial. That is discordant and we'll go through it slowly. Mitral funds uh, study included all heart failure patients with the mitral regurgitations in class two and above, and they looked at the outcome in terms of randomized into medical therapy with a uh, guideline. Uh, directed kind of medical therapy or a mitral clip on top of medical therapy. In one year, the heart failure as well as death in terms of chronic endpoint has no difference. This is in great contrast to the co-op study that randomized 600 patients, two times the number you get in mitral fronts, and then they actually look at 24 months as the primary endpoint is heart failure hospitalization, randomized to either device therapy or only uh, medical therapy alone. For the device therapy, it's important to say that they actually have to be optimized also on medical therapy uh, uh, with the heart failure expert to educate, educate that the patient has been optimized medically before randomization into either medical therapy alone versus uh, uh, on top of that with the device. Clearly shows that the device has got some um, benefit in terms of primary endpoint, very nice big p-value, 
And more importantly, over two years, the number to treat to prevent heart failure hospitalization is that of only three patients. What about uh, all cause mortality? Also, you can see that because of that is benefit in terms of all cause mortality, the number to treat of only six over two years. Then the real question is why are there co up results so different from the micro FR? The, the possibility actually in, uh, probably stems from the fact that the MR criteria is different. In, in micro FR, you include patients with EROA of more than 0.2 or more than 20 meters square with uh, LV dilutations that's more marked than the co op. You can see here that uh, in the micro fronts, the LV the mean LV dimension in terms of volumes is 135 and the EROA is 31 compared to co-op, which has got smaller LV volumes and the EROA of at least uh, 41 millimeters square. What is important is they must be on optimal medical therapy and this is adjudicated by the heart failure experts in the uh, co-op trial. They have to go through these heart failure specialist adjudications and they must be on maximum therapy before it's randomized. And even before randomization, randomizations, there's echo call that to, to, to adjudicate that the patient truly has severe mitral regurgitation based on the, the criteria that is uh, explained above. So a lot of uh, 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 controls here with heart failure therapy as well as the echo uh, call that. And of course, when it comes to outcome, it seems that uh, patients with a go-up study do have got better outcomes at one year with more reductions in MR um, uh, 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 results, which is less than two plus MR in about 95 patients per cent of the patients to go up. Probably reflect the fact that when we have very extensive LV remodeling, the MR reduction with click may not be that ideal. And that's just guessing from the metro FR, where there is very extensive LV adaptation, not so much of MR. In the baseline. So just key inclusion to uh, highlight in co-op study that there is a lower limit of LVDF of 20% and an upper limit of LV and systolic diameter of 70 millimeter that is set so that all these patients that is beyond this uh, uh, limit are excluded because believe that those people with extensive LV dysfunctions they have so advanced disease that their prognosis will be dominated by LV dysfunction rather than MR alone. Hence, FMR is truly a heterogeneous group. And this concept of proportionality of MR in patient LV dysfunction has been uh, introduced by uh, Graben and colleagues. What Graben and colleagues has really demonstrated is using the um, uh, Gollins formula to calculate the effective orifice area or regurgitation uh, fractions of the uh, volumes of the MR, it is really dependent on the left ventricular size in terms of volumes and ejection fractions. It is to say that when we assess or when we look at patients with FMR, the MR severity needs to be in, uh, described in context with the degree of LV dilatation. This is akin to uh, looking at aortic stenosis. When we calculate aortic valve area, we actually take into consideration the LVEF and stroke volume. So we should do the same when we look at patients with FMR. The effective orifice area, for example, in the patients with LVEF of 30 and regurgitation fractions of 50, that means it's severe. If the patient has normal LV volumes, to satisfy a severe functional MR by these criteria of more than 50% regurgitation fractions, they would have an effective orifice area of about 22. If you have LV dilatations at any of the patients we normally face in patients with chronic heart failure, they tend to have LV that's dilated. To, to satisfy the severity of MR that is more than, um, that should have an effective orifice area of at least of three. And if you have a patient with very marked LV dilatation, to have severe MR in this definition has to have effective orifice at least of 0.4. And if you have a patient who have low blood pressure and a high, grade, um, and a high LA pressure, then during systole, usually the MR severity, MR regurgitations uh, VMAX is actually less than or less than six, usually about four. So this tells me that if you have a um, high um, uh, 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 MR severity in terms of the VMAX, you should take that into consideration, into consideration as well, because these patients with low blood pressure, you probably need to have a higher threshold for EROA before you say that this patient is severe. So really, Interpreting the EROA has to take into consideration the LV volume as well as the blood pressure of the patients. 
Why is it important? Because we need to use some sort of concept to explain the MR dominant versus an LV dominant as a driver for decompensation in patients with heart failure. And this is probably um, uh, this, uh, summarized here in patients who go up uh, and, and mitral FR, mitral front patients can mean LV uh, volume that is dilated 252 and effective oral area in terms of MR survey of 3 And this is probably um, proportional MR in the degree of LV dilatation or dysfunction. And this is in comparison in co up the patient has a small LV volumes and effective oral area is greater. So the MR is more on disproportionate to the level of LV dysfunctions. You can then see with this concept of proportionality that any patients with uh, EROA of less than 0.2 tells me that, especially when the left ventricle is dilated, tells me that this is probably not the results of MR, but also did, but because of the results of LV dysfunctions. This is an inadvertent consequence of LV um, dysfunctions that the MR will probably be around 0.2 and below. So we have to take this into consideration when we examine patients with severity of MR, especially FMR. Thank God, um, at least lately, we recognize the limitations of doing EROA of uh, MR more than um, uh, 0.2, for example, in previous guidelines. And this is just to say that we have to interpret or uh, select patients whom we think MR is of importance in patients with LV dysfunctions. We pick those that is set a guide, a uh, cutoff. Point four and above, we are actually encompassing a broad spectrum of LV dysfunction with there's a degree of LV dilatation. So anything less than 0.2 probably is consistent with proportional MR, whereas uh, MR less than 0.2 is probably uh, proportional MR, and MR more than 0.4 is probably severe um, functional MR. And this is summarized in this uh, 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 slides that shows that if they have proportional MR, the MR severity is consistent with the degree of LV dilatations, then the treatment is really to um, uh, aim at uh, doing medical therapy, reducing uh, the left ventricular uh, volumes and reverse pneumonia, and then targeting the MR, the MR will actually improve. And in uh, contrast, those with disproportionate MR, you have LV that is not so big, but you have some sort of regional infarct, typically that of posterior uh, uh, wall mode, uh, wall of the LV, and then you have the disproportionate amount of MR uh, in the relation to the degree of uh, LV dilatation. Here, you will need, on top of medical therapy, some sort of intervention. And then you include a CRT if the patient has left on the branch block, where you want to synchronize the left ventricle, all segments to have a, 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 a reduction in MR. Suffice to say that all these uh, concepts of uh, concept. Uh, uh, volumes and uh, effective orifice area in terms of MR with respect to volumes, it is a, a concept, a conceptual framework. It is derived from the volumes formula, hence the volumes and the EROA values are not echo-based values. So when we apply this value, we shouldn't apply the absolute values in our patients that uses echo measurements because there is a lot of variability and there's a lot of limitations with echo alone. But the concept of big LV um, uh, not so much MR medical therapy is the, is, is the treatment. And whereas patients with small LV, a lot of MR, after optimizing medical therapy, we should think about medical treatment. This is just summarizing the mortality benefit we've discussed, but suffice to say, for mitral clip, it's a very strong um, uh, 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 predictor of a good outcome. So we should always think about that, that you have another therapy to treat this group of patients that has poor outcomes um, anyway. In terms of conventional versus comp comprehensive therapy, we now know that there are four pillars, at least um, comparing those with on four pillars, um, they will have a gain of at least eight years for those who are 55 years of age, hence highlighting the importance of medical therapy. SGLT2 is recently um, uh, proven in year 2019, so we mustn't forget this, and we, we know this very well that the four pillars has to be uh, instituted uh, uh, early. So we don't have a good uh, single parameters in terms of um, imaging uh, criteria for um, uh, selecting those who are symptomatic from severe functional mitral regurgitation. We all now have to go through this algorithm of optimizing medical therapy, get our heart, heart failure folks to optimize us. Uh, and at the same time, after they have been optimized, we should repeat echo. And when we repeat echo, we have to look at the MR 
affected for this area, as well as the left ventricular size. Anyone who has very huge LV or EF that's less than 20, probably in quadruplet may be too late. I just want to uh, end on with a case. This is a case of 78 years old female who has had previous uh, IHD with PCI and has a uh, medical therapy that's quite optimized. Note that this is the case of 2000, before 2019, I think it was January 2019, SGLT2 was not in the uh, optimal medical therapy, um, but um, certainly at that point of time, we have optimized her pretty well, and she shows um, LV ejection fractions of about 28%, and the MR is very severe, with MR PROA of 0.4. And the LV is not excessively dilated with a left ventricular and systolic diameter of 0.5. This is the echo pictures. You can see that the MR is really quite fierce despite medical therapy, and the DE shows a central coagulations uh, gap with mitral regurgitation that's very severe. Post mitral clip, one clip is uh, implanted in the A2 P2 uh, uh, standard, and you can see immediately the MR reduction is very uh, uh, substantial with only mild MR at the end of the procedure. This is the follow up of the patient on the biomarkers. Just looking at the biomarkers, immediately you have a reduction in anti pro BMP, and then a month, and at two years, she still had quite elevated uh, pro BMP, but she has been quite asymptomatic and she's been uh, doing quite well without any. Um, hospitalizations. I have the opportunity to be part of these recommendations in the APSC that's published just this year. Just suffice to say that anyone who has symptomatic severe mitral regurgitation who is already on medical therapy, we should really consider a heart team assessment and refer them for uh, mitral clip. We as a, a group think that we, the patient should receive at least one month of optimized medical therapy. And that will be at least something that we have to adhere to because microclip procedure is really not cheap. And at the same time, uh, those who have uh, proportional angle, uh, microclip probably do not uh, uh, help very much, but medical therapy certainly uh, will help in all patients. Lastly, um, just to say that uh, this is my conclusion slide. MR proportionality is a conceptual framework. It doesn't apply in absolute numbers to individual patients because of the limitations in terms of variability in uh, uh, methods of measurements as well as variability in response. In fact, in co-op patients, those who did not uh, get um, device therapy after medical therapy, there was a great reduction in the LV remodeling as well. may not be that great, about 10%, but there is individual variability that we need to think about. So all patients should be on guideline medical therapy, the four pillars we talk about, as well as consider them for part team referral if they're still symptomatic, despite medical therapy. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, this is an open for discussion. Any question from the panel? All right, thank you very much for the great talk. I have a question how long we should wait until we do the intervention because the you know, ICD should be implanted after three months of optimal medical therapy. But currently we're moving away from three months to longer period, let's say six or one year, because with the new drugs, they're continuous, uh, continuous reverse remodeling. So we have seen for the pro hf data that at one year, you have much less volume than at the baseline. And this effect really uh, takes, uh, takes place for a long time. So what is, in your opinion, the right time to perform the, let's say, mitral clip in patient with a severe function MR? Um, great questions, uh, Professor Park. This is always in our what we call the hard team uh, discussion, the first thing it has it been optimized. So usually we really um, advocate our heart failure folks who probably has had more experience in looking after this group of uh, heart failure with uh, reduced EF patients. They normally will tell us that, you know, we tried this and the patients has been fairly um, intolerable because of low blood pressure. So in those groups with intolerable to medical therapy, I agree that we probably need to react or need to do more aggressively. But those who are doing fine um, and you know you follow up uh, quite uh, regularly uh, those that, 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 that are doing fine, then I guess it's probably what we call natural selections that they are going to do fine anyway. So I guess it's really a team effort with um, uh, 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 um, everyone who, who, who 
will look after this patient. So in our center, we normally discuss this with the uh, imager as well as our heart failure expert. So how do we do that? We really look at morphology and the patients together. So if you have a patient who are clearly very tattered and, and the LV is very huge, irrespective of what you do, that's going to be poor outcome. So I think this continuous uh, 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 review of the case is important. I, I don't have a good numbers, but I think most people would agree that usually three months is probably a good number, but three months what? Three months to the fact that you have actually titrated your therapy, not three months just waiting, right? So three months, I think the important is you must be able to up-titrate your medicine without any ill outcome or side effect. Feeling rich that you can't reverse. Because I think when it comes to heart failure, it's not just medicine. What about anemia? Have you optimized the iron um, uh, uh, supplements? Is there anything in terms of rhythm that you can control that uh, Dr. Yu has already spoken on uh, earlier? So it's really an art trying to um, piece together when you should um, uh, 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 do a mitral peak. Yeah. Maybe I can jump in here. Uh, Jinju, that's a great question. In our consensus grouping, this question was debated and we're debating between recommending one to three months, but we say minimum about a month. I think the group that you're talking about, most patients can wait. The group that can't wait, they'll declare themselves to you very fast. They have recurrent admissions. They might need iron troops in those admissions. What you're fearful for is the group that really goes to stage four. They probably will benefit more from an LVAD or heart transplant rather than a secondary MR intervention. So that group is very difficult to separate out but the group that I can't wait, you, you can see them a mile away. Most patients can. Thanks. Yeah, although I must say that, uh, that my mitropic has been used in acute heart failure. Um, I think it's the mitral bridge study, which shows that it's feasible, but it is not something definitely not an RCT. So I, I would have uh, thought that as a heart team, we have to decide both who we should treat with a device and who we should actually treat with an advanced therapy such as LVAD. So, so usually we will get, you know, expert like, you know, the heart failure folks to, to, to chime in here to really, they are the ones usually who will give us their opinion on it. Any other question? Is a, just a very critical question. Is there any difference in terms of the etiology of heart failure and mitral people? Or ischemic and, and non versus non ischemic? Yeah, uh, good questions. Actually, um, um, there's no difference made uh, in terms of ischemic versus non ischemic uh, from what we know. Although patients with um, uh, uh, ischemia uh, type of patient or rather patients on heart failure with underlying ischemia, we should do revascularizations early because revascularizations can reverse remodel the LV and can make the, the, the MR reduce. So even though you have um, optimized your medical therapy, we are trying to say that after you optimize medical therapy and the patient is symptomatic, then do the echo. Because sometimes symptomatic with uh, severe MR versus patients with optimized medical therapy, the MR could have reduced. So remember to do an echo if the patient is symptomatic. Thank you. I think uh, time is much late behind. It's over 2 o'clock in Taipei. We have to close uh, the section, although that, I think there are so many questions to be asked. Uh, very much thanks a lot for the nice uh, arrangement for the section. In this section, we talked about uh, the ARNI as the first line medical therapy for heart failure. Also, we have the new the weapons. Now, that's the SGLT2I. That's more applicable for patients, uh, except for those with uh, ESRD or very low C EGFR. And for the third part is the device therapy uh, with uh, the CRT, either with ablation or not for the permanent AF. I think uh, Dr. Yu raised her opinion that, that uh, be more conservative for the AV node ablation unless it's really necessary. And the last one is uh, mechanical, so the mechanical, the instrumentation for the metal clip to pre prevent the progression of uh, yeah, particular for those uh, it's inappropriate extra 
uh, yeah, probably the mitral regurgitation over the, the heart failure itself to prevent the progression of um, uh, the heart failure. Of course, before the instrumentation, you got to have a uh, optimal medical therapy and uh, to revascularize it if there is any ischemia. Thanks a lot for everybody for your effort. Um, without the, uh, you will, the participation in this um, section would be not that, that really nice. <laughs> Thanks a lot, and uh, see you in the air. So, Thank you, bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.